Hello everyone, today we talk about the early Imperial Roman Legionary Disciplina, the greater liberty of the Praetorians and the Auxilia as far as especially the marriage with Peregrini women were uh, was concerned and we will see how um, and why this, this was the case. And we will talk also about military uh, diplomas that fit this, this broader context. Uh, let, let's see um, uh, what this is really. Um, so there's a lot actually we'd like to discuss today and we can start from one aspect that is they're never really discussed in Schwerpunkt in a, in a single video that is how the Italian genetic dominance in early imperial soldiery having to do with the expansion of course of the the, the imperium proper through this true genus right of the Romano Italic uh, Confederacy that uh, had by this point turned to a, a single solid uh, citizenry and that was perceived as we also discuss often in our videos about medieval warfare like seen as uh, a universal privilege of uh, in fact ecumenic dominance over all the other peoples in the world um, I should make a powerful digression but I will avoid it or at least um, you know cut it a bit um, regarding of course how the say the prevalent imagery of uh, Romanity has been sort of molded to the prevalently uh, multiculturalistic view in some especially aspects of uh, Anglo-Saxon um, let's say uh, scholarly unfortunately um, popularization uh, of in fact the Roman historical narrative right the fact that this was uh, basically a uh, standard like uh, that skin color didn't matter that all races were equal that there wasn't such thing like any discrimination that you know there was no hierarchy between this culture everything was so mixed or, and or at least uh, we do not, we cannot really say this or that because you know it depends on the perspective or whatever there's actually a rigidly objective uh, in fact hierarchical and catholic macroscopic evidence by the way that is to say that essentially an Italian people had come to dominate over the entire known entirely known world um, through a violent affirmation of course of the the ancient principle of the of the war bands of the of the heavenly election that was bled that blessed the Romans literally as the chosen people by God that of course was one uh, even if you, you've been told to, to distract you that to, this was a polytheistic system in the relativistic exception of there are some random gods that people fabricated because we all know that religion is a lie that God does not exist and whatever and, and not being aware of course of the most uh, you know universally known um, and unique uh, religious belief of the time of course everything was just like the, the generation of a single power and so different hands were just the the different manifestation of this fall, right? That's the the Romans, just like according to to ancestral prophecy, had come actually to invert partially. And this uh, overlaps also in the Christian narrative um, in the Augustan era with with the birth of Christ, the new Apollo. Um, in this, in fact, golden age that would have reappeared uh, temporarily. Uh, between the third and the fourth one, between the bronze and the iron one, um, and the topic is immense. I properly made a video if you're interested, at least in the ethnic issues, because uh, you know that's we all know that YouTube. I, I tell you that that YouTube attaches more uh, income, right? Has the best ads for topics that talk spe that that address this specific issues. Um, I don't talk too much about that, but I made a pretty, in fact, big, like I think YouTube, uh, YouTube's algorithm helped in that video, answering to uh, Metatron's video on criticizing, rightfully, let's say, the, the narcissistic interpretation of, say, um, of, the, of the Roman ethnicity that, however, went too far, like on the outer edge, and, you know, th this would, um, this is handling what happens, not just because 
you know, the guy makes legitimately some anti-black supremacistic um, sort of we would uh, kings that kind of stuff uh, criticism um, against the, that content. So to balance out, you you have to go in the opposite direction because the prevalent narrative, right, is truly this one that there was after all not much this huge deal or emphasis on genetic issues in the very word of Ganus that as you know has like all like this ancient language is a much more powerfully um, uh, semantic wealth than the one that we um, we intended today as a sort of zoological materialism thanks to the fantastic you know destruction of traditional values um, and that um, is uh, unfortunately like just like if you click a every single video on YouTube basically like the, in the do, that disturbingly uh, homogeneous documentaristic uh, form um, and imagery as well of, of the Romans like the, the standard and unchallenged and, and also pretty easily challengeable as we've seen also in, in that video response to Metatron with basic Latin literature and more of course um, as, a, as if that was not just overwhelmingly uh, enough in, in a quantitative sense what the entire deal properly of the empire conceptually was about right I will not spend myself to make parallelisms with what we well know in um, the field of I don't know anthropological psychological genetic um, uh, research nor with the clubs of its in theory um, but it's important to understand the pride of the of Rome in having accomplished what it had done by the by the early imperial times and how they were also for also because they are mirrored at, it's a double threat at a very practical pragmatic level and there is hardly uh, a more pragmatic people than than the Romans to preserve um, not much the uh, the genetic exception actually the Romans wanted these Italian genes to spread as much as possible but they needed the political support in fact a militarized people like the romans were because the roman was a soldier concept it wasn't a different um view it was the same reason why the romans built um arenas everywhere they went while for example in the greek part of the empire there was less of that etc um and um as an occupation force right that we in that sense uh we want that part of multiculturalistic um, narrative hi did highlight the fact, but not too much actually, the fact that this that the Romans came properly to mold even, uh, like when we talk about the ethnos, we can also partly, in fact, separate uh, that from the from the Ganus in observing how Western Europe and, and more, like also a great part of the Balkans was Latinized linguistically and peoples like still today like again the the the, the ones inhabiting uh, Iberia and, and and Gaul fundamentally speak a Roman Italic language um, as they had and had nothing in common with that before except the the basic Indo-European uh, background right so that's a quite um, meaningful aspect of the process of, of of Romanization in fact the same um, Roman imperial ideology that we will not discuss today I promise I have actually lots of videos on this very topic and we will observe it both genetically uh, linguistically etc today we talk mostly about how this was regulated at especially the strictly civic level right how marriages between the roman citizens um and the local uh, the, the roman soldiers right and the local women were uh disciplined why and generally speaking how it evolved in the you know from the first to the, the beginning of, of the third century AD, right but the background that i traced is is extremely important and it reflects a completely different view that is actually the the one that we know by by the the values that they own the, the traditionally correct one that would be in fact much more useful to teach roman history uh, than the pretty flat cheap and sort of uh, deterministic and materialistic one that we've been fed um, unscrupulously and 
and actually with a very specific purpose of destroying a certain narrative. Um, in uh, any case, um, when we look at the say, Trajan's reign, I made a video on him, um, we noticed that, as always, like this process of expansion had gone through a dilution, eventually, of the original stock of the conquerors. You find already, and I will make videos specifically also about this with the, the quantities, what we can reconstruct, um, the, the, the prevalence of non-Italian elements, right? When you talk about um, Italian, of course, we're talking about Roman Italy in the uh, comprehensive nature of the same. I mean, the fact that this had also included Gallia Cisalpina, that uh, other peoples like the Etruscans or the Ligurians or others, we do not even technically know whether they were Italic or or not, mixing with in part with the um, with the Illyrians. With this is not important. Italy had become one, and so we, we talk about the Italian peoples. We refer this to, of course, the the, the centrality of Italy for probably the in fact the Romano Italic Confederacy historically and in, also in the Augustan affirmation of a, of a truly imperial dimension is probably the one of a people of a specific uh, natio, a stock that rules over other nations and this hierarchical principle is in fact the one you should always look um, forward to in the traditional reading of all this this history not just the Roman one by the way. So when we speak here of non-Italian elements, we mean specifically Roman citizens. Um, let's leave aside the auxilia for one moment, because actually the Roman army had always been composed uh, at least uh, by as many non-Romans, fully speaking, uh, and uh, then by, in fact, Kives Optimo Iure. Right, um, but of course the the Roman legionaries were all kives optimo iure, um, and a, a, as such they reflected the previous Italian colonization that had been happening with the literal deduction of again uh, Italic Italian uh, citizens from quite a while in this process of proper military occupation. Uh, that was reflected also by the various um, offices covered by the senatorial nobility. Uh, you've seen the, the origins of this, the same emperors at this point was non-Italian, was starting to be non-Italian. But that, in this sense, were of Italian ancestry, still at this point, by great part. Right. This, for example, is a narrative that you know, it's not hidden, it's not countered, there's not much of an issue about that, but think this in the like, in the in the mind of peoples that are crucially obsessed with the idea that all humanity comes from like a single origin and that there is a different degree of say fall um, by which um, you have to look at which stock which branch actually prevails on one another right you could see that in a coldly like bureaucratic a secularistic way, saying, oh, well, look, oh, you see, now, uh, this guy was from Gaul, or this guy was from Syria, yes, but whose ancestors were his, actually, and in the process of Romanization, that, as you, you know, passed largely through the um, the gradual extension of the, uh, the citizenship to other locals, but that had been obvious, it had started, essentially, with the grafting of uh, full-blooded Italians, into these um, provinces from centuries, right? So for for uh, uh, for a long time before the provinces at some point were more or less homogenized to some degree um, politically, culturally, to be say, okay, well, we'll give you like a full citizenship like to, to everyone. It was also a great struggle in this. There was a great tension actually in um, the Roman, as you know, in, in the Roman Senate, especially regarding the property in extending further uh, the Roman citizenship to peoples that legitimately the, the Romano Italic world did not want to, to share too much power with. This is this influences notoriously and dramatically narratives like the one of Tacitus, for example, uh, regarding also how other peoples were seen 
um, how they made for the, for example, a much bigger deal, the the, the Battle of Teutoburg Force to say, okay, look, those are barbarians. They don't want to be Romanized. It's it's all lost. Don't you know? Let's not include Germany within our territory, etc. Right? Which is not just the reason why the Romans bail out of Germany naturally, but it, it, it's also something that we read um, the. Um, say we read history true and so it must be understood always in the uh through the lenses of uh the the authors and that's what that's the most beautiful thing in history in many ways because they literally tell you how they saw that which is fantastic and dramatically underappreciated uh, also in that aforementioned uh narrative um the um so at this point indeed uh these non-Italian elements, but largely uh, of Italian descent, dominated uh, within the legions, right, as Roman citizens, unavoidably. And they would continue, as such, in fact, with that task of, that mission, right, that evangelical Catholic mission of universal ecumenic nature of Romanization, um, that you're well aware of if you've read uh, Virgil and you have just a basic idea of what you know the 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 the, the res gestae are are about and what kind of again the, the the most truly Roman mentality was was really about, um, and that had already been initiated um, originally, as we said, from those um, carriers of the properly the not much just probably the Roman Latin classical language, but also the, the language of the Italians. In fact, one of largely of the Italic peoples that and and these other uh, elements that existed in Italy, that was that is the one that actually also influences uh the provinces the most, right? Because this was the soldierly uh, language, right? That was surely not um so close to the one that in the in the classical matrix remained, for example, more in Rome, also inspired the the, devel the later development of Italian through uh, through the through the same rereading of, of the very classical spring of can be the one of Kicker of Virgil as, as we were saying before, and that was resumed especially by the humanists in the later Middle Ages. Um, a reason for which, like the Romanians, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese speak. Like a, a language that, for example, has more S terminations. That that's uh, an Italic thing, specifically as opposed to our strictly Roman one. Um, these are in interesting linguistical uh, uh, shades that, again, today we do not discuss. But it had been happening from quite a while. Through, in fact, the settlement of Roman soldiers and merchants um, during, especially the first century A.D. Right, with, especially with the, that process of territorial stabilization of the frontier, probably the the affirmation of a fully European dimension of the Roman Empire from a Mediterranean one under Augustus. Right, so um, this was reflected in the legions, and and this um, process of provincialization of the army, as these guys would settle down and start living there, just not coming back to Italy, of course, was not. Uh, new. Uh, by this point, it had already began, as we've seen, for quite a while. Um, there are so many beautiful examples. For example, I don't know, in the Julio Claudian era, um, to cite some, some example, there is the, the case of the Legio Quarta Macedonica that was uh, disbanded in, seven, in 70 AD, in which you could already find by then men from Lugdunum from the um, Norican Teurnia and from the Noricum in, in general. But only in the second century you realize that this process becomes uh, decisive, right? Uh, the, the second century is the moment in which probably the non Italian uh, prevails um, in terms of. Uh, place of birth, literally, um, as a legionary personal origin, right, in the, again, in, in that generation. 
In the history of the legionary army, uh, we can read the entire uh, one of the Im imperial state, right? And this consists, of course, in that aforementioned as continuous relation of integration between Italy, um, the nu uh, basic nucleus of which, uh, in a politically organized sense, um, it, uh, starts from, and the provinces that gradually, um, but relentlessly, um, essentially blend in with Italy up to substituting her hegemonic uh, rule, right? Exactly for this reason, the problems of military organization become ever more complex at this time, right? Uh, you may think at this point it's we're talking about the peak of the Roman Empire that that's also the narrative you see like a sort of um, almost stagnating system that was just fixed as such actually these were say the Roman army was uh, say the Roman Empire in general was, was a grandiose thing that legitimately deserves that glory and reputation but it was also a very dynamic System. And there had been empires that had lasted even longer than this, um, and uh, that, of course, had had similar issues, right? And Rome, the history of Rome, this enormous um, offspring, right, managing, again, to tie the, um, the destiny of the world to uh, her own uh, ethnos and dominance, uh, is uh, a pretty tumultuous one, a pretty sudden one, right? If you look at the the chronological spectrum as well. And so um, within Roman politics, we must spot this uh, tense dynamic as well. The Roman army cater since the Augustan reform has remained the same. On one side, the legionary troops, the legionari. On the other, the auxilia the alares and the cortales, that is, the cavalry and, and the infantry, there were also the cortes equitatae, but never mind, to make the long story short. Um, and there were then also sort of special forces, that is, the praetorian cohorts, whose core to which Italian soldier especially inspired, as well as the urban cohorts, um, from one side, um, from the other, the Cortes Civium Romanorum, and endly the navy, right? The, uh, I talked about this, the, the reorganization of the army, the Augustan reform, um, if you go in the Augustan era playlist, you will find uh, some of these aspects dealt with in, in some depth, then of course we'll come back prepotently many times, because, you know, otherwise how do we have fun up here, right? The aforementioned Roman citizen Optimo Iure, and in the first century AD, especially the Italian one, enlists in the legions, sometimes also in the Cortes Civium Romanorum, and in the best cases in the Praetorian cohorts. Right. This is notoriously a voluntary military service of at least 16 years in the Praetorian cohorts, at least uh, of at least 20, as a matter of fact, in the legions. Right. You know how the Praetorians were selected. Will not um, just digress on this, but you know how many privileges they earn, in fact, from from their um, from their curriculum um, in the army. The Peregrini, uh, so the non-Roman uh, citizens, are enlisted instead in the aforementioned ally and cohortes that are not grouped like the uh, the Roman ones within a uh, legion, right? Um, so we're talking about the auxilia, and this is the uh, military service of 25 years that the men of the subject nations are owed 
to perform or wrong, right? Never forget this aspect that uh, stresses what, in fact, I was t telling before. The Romans had a voluntary vocation to their military dominance over other peoples, right? These other nations were mostly cold, right? In some cases, they were voluntaries as well, but we're talking at this point Orientals, Thracians, Pannonians, the Brautians, the Brautians were other, um, were an Illyrian um, um, people, uh, the Dalmatians, the Norrishans, as we were talking about before, the Russians, the Gauls, the Hispanics, uh, etc. Um, and remember that slaves and uh, Peregrini also served in the navy, right? That is run by the the Roman the Roman sailors, right? Um, the, and the in this case, like these um, uh, non-Romans have the longest service of all, 26 years, right? So this means that, of course, the as the same term was adopted in our own language, the auxilia had an auxiliary role. They had to support the what had been the decisive ethnos that had literally subjected these populations by rule of conquest, and that now, um, given that these peoples had accepted the Roman rule because they were under it, uh, and that's the only discriminant that exists uh, politically, were to serve the rulers. And in this process, however, being co-opted to that process of divine transfiguration that the world was trying to attain, and that, of course, was achieved through um, self-sacrifice in holy conduct just by universal doctrine um, and 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 it was thus uh, a privilege to fight next to the chosen people um, and we know how much the auxilia actually spent themselves and the tribute of blood that they paid for Rome in order to achieve uh, a higher condition including the one of the same Roman citizenry this is not what we're going to look at today but uh, we will have to talk more profusely about the auxilia in, in, in many ways. Um, and, but to, to express the positive nature of the auxiliary conscription that is often not uh, truly brought up, um, let's make just an example from Tiberius' reign uh, that comes from uh, the same Josephus, right? given we're talking about Jews, 1,000 of which, in fact... And we're talking about the community of Rome, the, the most ancient uh, Jewish one in Europe, at least of the size that it would uh, be uh, would enlarge itself from from there historically, um, having been uh, obliged uh, to perform military service by the Romans, are punished in the case in which they uh, refuse themselves, and in this. Uh, information that uh, Flavius Josephus tells us is also quite, uh, just by the way, for those people who think that, that the history is written by the winners, ask Polybius, ask Flavius Josephus, right? Um, but nevertheless, the, this latter's um, uh, quote is interesting because um, it's a sort of starting point for the still, of course, approximate calculation, however, of the actual size of the Jewish community of Rome, in Rome, in the city, in the Urbs, um, that is also the one in which, at this point, the first Christian community of the city, of the holiest uh, after Jerusalem, or in parallel to that, for that matter, uh, will uh, would form, right? Um, and there are, uh, like, lots of references. For example, the Gemma Augustea, um, already represents legionnaires and auxiliaries together. So, as obviously one in the fully Catholic ecumenic sense, right? You know what the, the Gemma Augusti is, right? It's cameo into Strata. It, uh, it's preserved today at the Kunsthistorisches Museum of, of Vienna, right? It's, it's one of the, the masterpieces of the uh, Augustan era. And we will perhaps comment on its iconography and symbolism uh, in another video, because it's a very important uh, source. Um, gradually, we witness, of course, a sort of, um, you know, uh, 
closening in the ties between the ro uh, the, the troops constituted by the Romans, so the, the legionary troops, and the one of the foreigners, the auxiliary ones, the legionari, uh, the the Kivas, right, and, and the Peregrini. Already since Tiberius' times, there is um, a problem posed by the legionary enlistment, because it is voluntary, but it's also not literally uh, a service for, for everyone, or everyone who wants to um, really uh, lead that life. For example, Tacitus attributes to Tiberius the observation that the volunteers of the legions are not easy to recruit, right? And they're not always the best because exactly, for example, the beggars, the vagabonds um, prefer a uh, military career. Uh, this is an ongoing theme, right? Just yesterday I was talking about Falstaff and, you know, the the soldierly status in, in the early modern times. And of course, there was already, like, especially in such a big emperor like the Roman one, that after the civil wars had found its own internal balance uh, on the basis of this, uh, in fact, dynamics we're, we're uh, describing, had also sort of gentrified. And so there was this point of, yes, you have settled the veterans, you have started um, uh, like a new um, uh, establishment, right, a new regime, um, what about like those political and social dynamics that concern military career? How many people, right, of the uh, the early ones that really needed to um, fight in order to get their land? As in the past, it had been you know, things still work like you, you needed to have land in order to go at war. Uh, at this point, and how many of their children want to be soldiers? In the same way, especially considering they're full Roman citizens, they can do what they want. There, are, there is the question of, of the modus and of the general, like how do we rely, like considering that the Roman army is also not huge, like if you think about 250,000 men for an empire that stretches literally from Scotland to to the Persian Gulf um, and from Morocco to, um, to, to Armenia and beyond it's like you know, it's very few, right? They can barely cover anything. If, if the Romans had not been loaded with that atrocious uh, moral strength that had allowed to take over all these other peoples, like, this thing could have not kept, uh, could have not been kept together. And when you look at what happens in later centuries, you realize that, after all, the balance held pretty well, even of the crisis uh, and all. Right, the what Tacitus uh, says specifically, uh, this phrase we paraphrase was voluntarium militem des ac si speditet non eadem virtute ac modestia agere quia plerunque in opes ac vagi sponte militem sumant. Right, on the other hand, the auxiliary troops um, are undergoing a similar process. We've seen it in a couple of videos about the so-called, for example, Levantine archers. Um, we talk about it when we discuss the, the difference between the like uh, the, in the, the variation, at least in popularity, of the sling versus the bow in some as tactical specialties in the ethnic world that, in fact, get diluted after these troops have been essentially uh, stabilized, like in permanent units, as you know, with the Augustan reform, um, and th this process had already started that same process of the gentrification that the Pax Romana entailed pretty much for everyone, for rulers, conquered, um, etc. And that also, in fact, makes these units losing their original ethnic cohesion, right? Uh, we'll see really better in some other video, but the, the idea is that uh, there are some, uh, you know, functions even within the Roman army that are gradually uh, disappearing because the same auxilia gradually Romanize, and so you must, uh, as it would happen in the later Roman Empire, like sort of specialized, actually the, the, the Roman 
citizens at that point, rather subjects, into like a multi-arm, um, say, tactically integrated system, which is yet another challenge. And it had already, in spite of the, the, the might and the preeminence of the, the Roman army at this point, been a problem already um, from these centuries, right? So also in, in the case of the, of the foreign troops, um, quite soon the um, Peregrinus soldier that serves militarily in the auxilia were, will tend to denationalize. Right. He also because he wanted to become a Roman citizen. So again, the the narrative that this was okay, like just the Romans throwing citizenship at everyone and saying there are no differences. Don't worry, multiculturalism will ever function. And of course, it doesn't. Actually, in that world, was reversed in, in this dynamic. Mostly, as it sort of always happened throughout all these millennia for for other peoples as well it's just like the the subjects wanted to elevate themselves to the same uh, 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 condition of the conquerors because this divide did exist and whoever is telling you that it didn't is lying badly right also exploiting the gross undereducation that comes with that this nonsense uh, entails so once the 25 years are of, of military service are performed, the Peregrinus will normally become a Roman citizen. And other lesser popularized fact, in some cases he already had been, right? Um, and he is normally since the second half of the second century, right? So bear in mind also here the difference between uh, civic status and military condition, which is not directly proportional, at, especially at, uh, as we were saying, the more times go on, goes on. Um, so in, in Antonine times, for example, you can say that um, both the legions and the auxilia are enlisted on a regional criterion. So the regionalization, the provincialization of the Roman forces is not something that is born just like in the in, in late antiquity. It was already like a natural tendency because gradually the people who had inhabited the same place, regardless of their origin, had tended to, to blend together and the, the territorial basis was sort of the most obvious, which they, uh, given the, the provincial administration, like they would be recruited. And this this entails other sub reforms that normally we don't count in the after a few big ones that the Romans really had, um, because it's it's not much a matter of military essence. It's it's rather how uh, and where did these people were recruited. Um, normally we attribute this to Hadrian, uh, but um, as also all reforms are really just the result of a already uh, uh, accomplished process, right? Never think that when you hear these great names of reformers like Marius, it's like, you know, Marius invented the cohort. No, they already existed. It was already there. Like, the entire Marian army was there before Marius came about, right? He just formally sanctioned that. Otherwise, we wouldn't even know about that. And his reform was mostly just, as you know, a, a political one, not really a military one. The military one was just the the automatic consequence of that. Uh, but again, this is not the narrative that you often use. Now, when Aelius Aristides, in, in, in that uh, encomium of Rome, of his, um, uh, turns to describe the originality of the Roman military system, the distinction between the legions and the auxiliaries does not show up, right? And here we're talking about the second century, right? So in a time in which you would think, well, by standard, that was the rigid distinction between the, the two forces. That's not quite the same. And we will see it, um, especially when we talk about arms and armor, right? Because auxil the auxilia very often were also equipped 
um, with the same legionary armament at a point. Not always, admittedly. This is it, it is true that tendentially they had they were l- worse equipped than the legionnaires. But this is true as long as the legionnaires maintain, in fact, a, a political uh, superior status compared to them at a civic level. This is true for the beginnings. Um, we know during the the the, the, the wars of, of the uh, of the four emperors, like you have, um, like Batavian barbarians showing up in the Roman form, literally with the force of their original ethnic custom. At that point, of course, the the legions had quite a, an excellent panoply compared to them because they were truly auxiliaries. But things would would change over time. Alius Aristides insists rather on the Romanization of the auxiliaries through the concession of the citizenship. He writes something like this. It says, uh, you're, because he as a Greek is speaking to the Romans, and see also this, right? How the peoples within the empire, some different levels were considering the Romans that were ruling on them, like the preservers of this broader ecumenic system, especially the Greeks always thought that they were technically always free and that they weren't under the Romans, ideally, because, you know, of course, the reality was different. But here, it's, 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 you see the ethnic divide at a, at a higher level. So your system of recruitment is characterized by the fact that in all the subjected um, regions, you sought for those that were uh, disposed to military service and finding them, you would detach them from their fatherland, giving them as a compensation the Roman citizenship so that they would feel ashamed of their origin. This is a, an extremely important passage. This corresponds exactly to the anthropic sense of shame of inferior cultures that we still witness today, right? While the West, um, and just because of the Marxist, but the bad side of the story gets into guilt trip, the rest of the world feels ashamed of itself. Right? That's the feeling that those peoples right now feel, because they know they are at a different level than the, the Westerners. And um, for a specific reason, here Aristides nails it completely. You have made them soldiers when they ha- you had make them citizens. This, this is insane, right? It, it sounds like the battle hymn of the Republic almost, or something like that. And it's um, this was what had amazed, especially the Greeks that would have never extended their citizenship um, to anyone. Um, and that is true. They are witnessing the true Roman uh, Catholic Evangelion here. Um, they realized what the Romans had been able to carry out in the world, in a transfiguring sense, um, uh, divinely speaking, because they had allowed the subjected peoples to to be elevated by the rulers in their magnanimity. This is also the famous the famous the famous Virgilian Ovid, right? You will nurture, you will protect the subject, you will. Um, you will crush those who try to elevate themselves, right, uh, and against you, right, the, uh, outside the order. Um, and so also from this point of view, the history of the Roman army is parallel, obviously enough, to the history of the Roman citizenry. We have um, typical documents evidencing this history. The aforementioned military diplomas that essentially once you had uh, finished your military service would confer you the civitas but also the connubium with peregrini women to uh, the uh, auxilia and the classici to the soldiers or a connubium with peregrini women to the praetorians right and 
the legionari would not receive these diplomas because they are always the basic troop of the Roman, among whom the ancient discipline was preserved in the most brutally rigid way possible, and according to which, in fact, these troops could not get the right of connubium, so to marry, with peregrini women. This distinction is extremely important for the reasons we will highlight now. First of all, the fact that these guys do not have right of connubium with foreign women does not mean that he, they may not have an actual family and children with them. They had, right? This is also that. It, it, it's fully part of that Roman dominant um, mentality, right? The dominant affirmation that the Romans had to spread their seed all over. They had to impregnate the world with the with the sap of divine glory, right? These were the Ganus that again had taken over these people. These peoples belonged to Rome, right? And to the Romans as a chosen race. Um, the um, important, however, was to preserve, also for reasons of occupation forces, a rigid separation uh, at, a poli at, at a civic level between the imperial troops and so those who owned the imperium proper and the rest of these uh, nations right the sense was that if i am a roman soldier and i marry a foreign woman my children will be essentially of double race, and they will not be as attached in that level of uh, dispersion that, after all, the, the large mass of the Roman legion, we're talking again about, about 100,000 soldiers, not too many, right, to hold the entire empire, will dilute itself in, like that sense of attachment to Rome, etc., will not be immediately out there. You want, on the contrary... This is what the Romans come up pragmatically with the same auxilia as we've seen to actually go back and forth to denationalize and to become something more controllable. Right? You exploit their talents, you make them, uh, you know, you promote them to Roman citizens after only after having deserved that, also with in a, with military exploit. And so these earned that right to cooperate to become Romans. Right, um, so you can make them marry with foreign women of sort because it it's not important. Like if they lose their own identity, it's on them. And as Romans, just we let them do that because we're so ho uh, high and mighty, right? But as far as our soldiers are concerned, we want to maintain our uh, Roman identity strong. We want the the same moral and material resources of the legionary as uh, as a Roman citizen flowing within only within um, a Roman channel right a Roman vessel so the legionary can contribute to impregnate women but not to marry them because their children otherwise will become Romans and diluted ones Right? I think this is an incredibly important point because it's literally the logic that lays under this, this attitude. And it obviously goes against the idea that Rome, after all, did not care. This was an open world. Nobody really cared about the differences. Um, this is really just our liberal melting pot. And it, it wasn't at all. Right, There were brutally uh, coherent concerns, by the way, just for the properly political and strategical um, balance of the empire. Right? And this is the reason, actually, why the Italians remained so much in charge of the situation uh, for, for so long, right? And that aside from the fact that Italy was very prolific, was very popular, it had properly um, swelled under its own demographic resources that had been enlisted like crazy by the Romans that had began to take over these this other peoples and to alter, as we've seen properly, even their ethnic identity. 
um, in the process. And of course, they wanted like the this, the Roman establishment that was mostly Italian based, and or that especially at a higher level in in the origins was fiercely Italian in that sense, and spoke Latin, and of course was you know part of or Italic for that matter for th those other branches uh, of the of the Italic languages. Um, uh, of which Latin is part, um, and that um, embodied, incarnated, biologically, that Roman superiority over the other peoples. This is why the legionnaires, that are after all the people that go more, that are more out there, right, the Roman citizens that originally are sent more abroad, right, are regulated um, to the point that they can't marry these women. Actually, as you've seen here, the Praetorians actually can, right? The Praetorians can marry foreign women, which also comes with a bit more of an expectation, probably, from them. I mean, surely that there was some romantic Praetorian that, aside from, uh, you know, making a desert and calling it peace, um, you know, by slaughtering a congress amount of people would like to marry for love. But the idea is that if you were a, a Praetorian, um, you know, and especially if you were the child of a Praetorian, you still maintain a radically, as traumatically brutal Romano-Italic identity, um, and the woman that also had become the, the vessel of this of this procreation would sort of have been chosen in a broader cultural sense. Uh, such the Romans, of course, as we've seen, were very sensitive to the idea of since Romulus Kellers of um, as the rape of the Sabines really shows to to seize you know um, these fresh uh, puellae from from the rest. Uh, of the world, but in in general, um, this was seen mostly as an accomplishment at a higher level, right? Yes, you want a peregrina, but you want her to be uh, like uh, at a higher level, maybe mixing with the local gentry or or historians, because this would come with benefits. And yes, your children, Praetorian children, would be um, could be like from this mixed marriage, because it 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 was counted that that Praetorian blood was the finest of the finest, and so. Um, of the Roman people and could not dilute simply by marrying with a with a foreign woman, right? And this, as you understand, we just explained like change over the centuries because gradually there are ever more Roman citizens that are mixed with others. Um, and uh, and here we're talking about the army, by the way. Yeah? There were also practical military reasons for which you didn't want the legionary troops to get married um, with local women. Uh, in general. Um, first of all, it was a matter of, of, you know, discipline, right? Most legionnaires at this point are de facto stationed uh, permanently uh, on the frontier, right? Basically from Augustus times, like the, the major, you know, troops concentration is the Rhine, is the Danube, it, it remains pretty much like that. There are substantial forces in Syria and just some other few, like in, in other... In our provinces. So de facto the legionnaires are already stationary. Yes, they move, there are civil wars, there are other campaigns of conquest, but they eventually come back where they, they station and for others. Sometimes they change location, but still for a long term, we're talking centuries even. So it's obvious that a Roman legionnaire would leave de facto in a foreign land for at least most of his life. And um, again, he would have uh, all the women he wanted. There were some regulations as far as, you know, who could visit the camp, but the true principle behind this prohibition of marriage was the fact that if you had familiarized too much with the locals, you would have tended to lose your blind fate to Rome, just because we know that the snake of evil is always rotting the, um, the, the, the roots of the Capitoline oak, right? Um, so we know that the world is going to age and sink, right? And and to um, to degenerate. Tacitus is quite explicit about this and the fate of the Imperium itself. They they were all very aware of what um, like the world would go towards because of the of the sin of of um, of man. Um, there was also just another reason why like the the legionnaire would be brutalized in this sense is that he really had to embody those characteristics of true 
occupation force that didn't have to care like about human life, obviously and uh, legitimately, um, and that had to be simply devoted to the ultimate principle of world domination without any trace of compassion towards any living being, um, except of course the the ultimate uh, imper uh, imperial medium, right? Um, so this is how the Roman legions counterpose themselves through such way, not just to the auxiliary and, and the fleet, by the way, that is uh, the fleet we've, we've seen it before with the classici. So uh, we're talking uh, units that were originally, at least in a theoretical sense, um, foreign, uh, even though, as we've seen, they began to, to be Roman, even they were Roman citizens serving auxilia, as we recalled before, in the second century, especially. Um, and um, But also to the Praetorians, as we explained before, right? So, uh, units of Italian origin. Tacitus is quite uh, explicit when he says Italiae alumni. So the awareness of the different legionary discipline is truly a fundamental motive of the entire Roman history. It's still alive around the, the 5th century. And we've seen even in that video about the late Roman army how even when the West sort of evaporates there are some Roman units that keep serving uh, under the Romano-Germanic governments and that preserve their ethnic distinctions and pride um, revered by, the, by the, the populace and you know, considered as like the relic of world domination that the same Germanic rulers were were seeking for so uh, so avidly. So the history of the uh, diplomatic concession can be illustrated. Besides uh, uh, the particular considerations that can be always found, like around these topics. Also, by this different sense of discipline. I'm writing just right now something of, between virtus and disciplina for actually, um, for actually medieval times, but still for the Holy Roman Empire, by the way. Um, the soldiers of the Roman army to whichever unit he belonged, by principle, could not, as we've seen, contract conjugal unions during the period of the of the service. Right after this, right, this is really remaining throughout all the second century. Is remember just for the for those who served at that moment. After that, it was another issue, right? But the important was that as long because the imperium was sacred. You know, and you could not um, essentially provide it to people that were not fully Roman in the moment. It was so sacred that you could not uh, simply allow that somebody who was bearing arms in that fashion could simply unite himself to a degree that would dilute the absolute devotion to the imperial cause. Again, the sole purpose of a Roman legionnaire is conquering the world, right, and slaughtering anyone who will be between him and that. He is literally conferring that moment the means, right, of, of the Imperium, and he cannot be uh, sharing this with, say, um, a woman, especially of, a, of an inferior race that he has subjected and that he cannot be bewitched by uh, in that in that dimension. This is a bit like the history of Ines himself with Theto, and um, you know that that's a beautiful representation of the sort of stoic attitude that the Roman hero must have, even in the face of the the most strongly sensual Pelasgian forces, right of the Queen of of Carthage that basically uh, kills herself and. Carthage on the longer run because of the the curse, right? That 
she preferred against Rome, that at that point, uh, you know, was already destined to take over the world, of course. The, the this idea, of course, is perfectly matching with the rigid discipline of the legions. Uh, as the privileged position of the Praetorian, that has already proven that he's beyond any doubt, that he is truly the the best of the at the best, the finest, the elite, right? And he can afford to dispose. You see, these guys guard the emperor himself, so there is something metaphysically immanent in their own condition, and they can they are provided essentially with this that they can bear arms within like the Italy, right? Which is something again that, you know, you can do only if you trust these people individually. This is not just about the fact that they were not a legion because there were traditionally nine cohorts. But it's the fact that they can in the first place because they have won by their military exploit the right to afford that superiority. This is an incre and, and the responsibility that comes with that this is an incredibly beautiful thing. So this goes well from quite a while together with again the privileged position in Praetorian, the um, auxiliary um, one as well. There is only one exception, but we do not know exactly when it started. Um, that we we find in the Antonine era, the consuetudo of the sailors with their women. Right, but um, naturally, it's difficult that um, for for men that are uh, far away from their uh, house, right, for twenty or twenty five years, um, de depending on whether they were again legionnaires or, or auxiliaries, or even longer, as we've seen, not to contract some sort of vow with um, some woman. Uh, we. Uh, don't have a uh, contubernalis or a focaria woman, right? That would leave like with with men like this. Um, uh, exactly at the uh, in the frontier, we find um, strong uh, citizen nuclei rather that allow the soldier to marry locally, and that become the vehicle of Roman civilization. So also ethnically speaking, that, that this is really what allows as we've seen those languages to spread, by the way, in, in areas that were importantly populated, right, overall. Like so um the the effect is, is quite uh, is quite intense in areas like Spain, Gaul, uh, the Danube, right, you know that before the the Slavic migration, essentially there is, uh, like, the, along the Danube, they, they didn't speak, like, the eastern half, like, mostly Greek, they would speak Latin, Romance, and that's also where the, the blacks uh, had, uh, uh, as we've seen in different videos, originated from, but then there is a strong Latin influence also in the southern uh, Slavic languages, especially Serbian, Croatian, and this is kind of obvious. Right, considering the like the paths of of Romanization, the proximity to Italy. Um, so at the moment of this charge, the Roman legionnaire had a juridically clear position. He can regularize his relation with um, an eventual contubernalis um, if she is a Roman citizen herself. Because um, in that case, uh, you, uh, there, there were no problem in, again in, in having that relationship uh, before. Um, he cannot regularize that, meaning that he cannot recognize his children as Roman citizens, which doesn't mean he, he couldn't have them, and they would have them, of course, if this woman is a peregrina. Right? So she's, she's not a Roman woman. And, and this to, uh, as we've seen, avoid that the, the legionary troop um, would uh, affectionate itself too quickly to uh, those provinces as 
the uh, Saint Tacitus says, in quibus stipendia ex pleverant, that is to say, where they were essentially like, you know, they were, they were receiving the pay for, right? Um, and so not to um, prefer in those provinces the union with foreign rather than with Roman women, right? This to an extent, like, it, it, I don't think it's realistic to pretend that this was mostly a way to hope that they would, for example, come back to Italy, uh, especially after, like, really the first um, generations of Roman settlement that would, would necessitate, as we've seen, of these properly Roman nuclei there. But to, again, hope that the Roman citizen communities would strengthen properly in the frontier, as it would happen, and that um, it would allow the Roman rule to remain solid and florid. Different is, of course, the condition of the auxiliary. Because for the soldier of the ally and the cohortus, the unions with foreign women, and with women that could be actually of their own nation, foreign, non-Roman, here we mean properly peregrini, are completely natural, right? And to him, uh, that um, in exchange will, as we've seen, actually serve for a longer time compared to the legionnaire, the Roman state allows, through the military diplomas, the civitas, as we've seen at the moment of discharge, if he's not uh, a Roman citizen already, and the connubium, together with the uh, right that the children of that connubium would be, without any uh, other process, Roman citizens. Right? So this is incredibly important for them as fathers, right? And just uh, also as individual uh, subjects of Rome. It's likely that the institution of these military diplomas of discharge for the auxiliaries, and to which are added the ones of the navy, uh, have to be attributed to the wise generosity of the emperor Claudius. Uh, you know, the Julio-Claudians were all exceptional emperors, from the first to the last people who just, um, you know, uh, look too much at Flavian gossip, will not appreciate a Caligula or a Nero, but they were some of you know, very good um, rulers, as a matter of fact. Claudius, there is always this sort of back and forth, this issue, especially with the Senate, like as the Roman monarchy tends to affirm itself um, over the uh, the nobility in this crucial moment of still ex territorial expansion, of conquest, right, um, to enlarge the basis of Romanity in order to grant a more solid control uh, of the same provinces that otherwise the noblemen could have simply um, just uh, strangled with, with their luxus, um, privatizing them, eroding public authority, and so uh, also making the, the whole empire more fragile, right? Uh, on the example of the auxilia, the Praetorians wanted to participate with the right of Connubium with the Peregrini, um, because um, some of them will have had the tendency to this kind of unions, as we were saying before. Nor Rome had, in the concession to the Praetorians of the Connubian with the Peregrini, that uh, scrapple of principle that it always had towards the legionaries. This can be easily explained also just by the numbers, right? The Praetorians were much less... Um, than the legionnaires, um, and uh, their women that uh, we have to presume as Praetorians, um, they would have chosen them like within the same row, likely, right? Uh, more likely than not, and also because of reason of properly a social connection, right? Um, uh, were, even in the case when these were Peregrini, for sure, as we were pointed out, much closer by contact, by connection to Roman culture than the provincial peregrini, right? Um, 
and uh, and obviously enough, the legionnaires that instead lived out there in, in the uh, in the provinces on the frontier, like they would have more directly mingled with in the first place. Um, so this is actually part of the reason why uh, some Roman citizens preferred to enlist in the auxilium. They could marry, right, uh, foreign women. It's a very interesting thought, right? Uh, there was a more lax discipline in general, the greater possibility of choosing their own woman, also foreign one. Um, after all, in 140, Antoninus Pius uh, innovated mm, remarkably the praxis of these military diplomas of this charge for the auxilia, establishing that the citizenship was granted to um, the children that, they that the auxilia would have had after the discharge, not those that they had had still uh, previously, right? And this actually is a step backwards aimed at restoring uh, uh, the, the older balance for military discipline, right? The sense is that, so the Roman army required uh, this in the first place, the auxilia of Antonine times are not the ones of, again, Tacitus, I made a video actually about the Antonine Severian Legion here that is another story, but um, you can see there some important transformations towards also sort of more uniformed um, force because even if the auxilia had become, through the extension of citizenship, through the uh, this process of homogenization with the legionnaires, a force that could not afford to have lower disciplinary standards. Right, there was uh, a tendency towards uh, an homogenization, so these allowances were sort of seen as, um, you know, uh, too much for the overall balance within the the Roman military. Uh, an important innovation in all this matter, even if the documentation is more scarce about it. Um, except for the 3rd century where military diplomas actually uh, exemplify, uh, was in fact carried out later through the official concession to contract unions during military service, famously enough, at the time of Septimius Severus. Right? Um, in fact, this emperor would grant officially to the soldiers the right to uh, leave with their women properly even uh, in the in the camp, right, with their families there. Uh, we do not have to forget that this concession preceded uh, shortly the extension of the citizenship to all the inhabitants of the empire, right, uh, except for the Deditici or Deditici that was enacted in 12 12 by Septimius Severus' son, Caracalla, famously enough, the Constitutio, uh, the Constitutio Antoniniana. The Deditici were um, people who had, in fact, dedicated themselves to the Roman governance, right? They had voluntarily subjected to Rome to be protected by her, and as such, they were not. Uh, even when living within the Roman Empire, it would often happen, um, not just individually, but sometimes in entire communities, were not considered Roman subjects, strictly men. Um, there is a bit of ambiguity, of course, we can't tr trace everything precisely. But I made a video that uh, I here, uh, I think I can't find now, but it is one, um, the one about... Maximinus and the central, yeah, yes, Pupienus, Belbinus, Gordian the uh, Third, Maximinus Thracians, the Praetorians, the Europe's, and the Italian Revolt, which is a long title that actually tells you how much was going on still uh, in terms of the Italian awareness of the centrality uh, of their of its centrality in the empire 
um, imperially speaking, uh, at the time of Maximinus. And in that video, we also observed how there were peoples within the uh, Roman Empire that even after the Edict of Caracalla were in fact not considered, um, of course, homogeneously uh, Romanized, but in some cases probably not Roman, right? So it was still an important difference as far as these divides really um, existed. Uh, that's an important concept because we are before the the crisis of the third century, at least the you know the the most um, the most difficult moment. And um, you see there that this balance, again, the, the idea of a, an Italian centrality in the empire, that the fact that there were different provinces, different layers, different strata like of, uh, of peoples, uh, hierarchically ordered within the empire, was still pretty much alive. And that this had not really been dislodged um, by that point still. For telling you also how um, in this dynamic, like how solid the Roman foundations had really been, right? How the system founded by Augustus was practically all the, uh, up for, after more than uh, two centuries. Um, so we understand that also Septimius Severus Alloans to to have uh, women in, in the army at that point was uh, just coming, not just from the normal uh, cases of coexistence, in a settled, like in a military frontier among like the, the locals. But from the fact that more or less now the entire empire was, like if you could speak Latin essentially, um, consider you a Roman without too much uh, of a problem, right? Um, so it, it's really like a, a great part of the history of the Roman army that revolves around the length of the military service and what this entailed for these people, right? The 16 years of the Praetorians, the 20 of the legionnaires, the 25 of the auxiliaries, and the 26 of the sailors. These men were military professionals and they, of course, do not uh, abandon uh, any occupation. They do not cut truly any tie during their long military service. I mean, people leave very few. At the time, like, you know, if you survived your youth, um, this was not much their concern, like they're talking about mostly childhood and adolescence, you had fairly good chances to arrive to 60, 70 years old, but I mean, 25 years, uh, even 20 years in the army was just like a much bigger deal than it is today in many ways. Also considering what the military life and life in general uh, presented in terms of risks uh, of violence, etc. compared to, to today, right? Admittedly, um, especially like in the early empire, it wasn't such an enormously risky business to be a soldier um, because, generally speaking, that the word was pacified that the peoples of the frontier were not that threatening um, and so uh, there would be room in fact for another like for a for a parallel life of some sort even though the the, the military one came first hence the great inspiration of the Roman soldier that is the life in the city right the city as you know, is the cornerstone of the Roman Empire, even though the overwhelming majority, as always, in every pre-industrial society of the population lives in the countryside, the city is a bit like the um, the emblem of Roman civilization. Uh, every Roman city is founded as a copy of Rome. Um, and this means, as we've seen, that basically this is the center of the elected people, right? It's a representation of that divine order on earth that's how the romans built their own empire they connected with uh, roads with aqueducts and in this all to serve this privileged elite right of roman citizens that truly are uh, above the rest right and where all the attractions all the, the opportunities uh, would mostly 
arise, right? So this is also a reason why the most sought after career is the one of the Praetorians. Um, we're talking about just like uh, 10,000 men, uh, at least those who um, remain as such up to the reform of Septimius Severus, um, that um, besides the many privileges can also enjoy the urban life, right? The, the life in the center of the world. Um, the same urban life of Rome, right? Um, and uh, with the military diplomas, they can even obtain, as we've seen, the uh, recognition of the citizenship for the children that uh, they would have after the discharge from foreign women. But the legionnaire instead does not have such comforts or comp compensations for the rigor of his discipline. If we calculate 33 legions of 5,000 men each, we are in presence of, in fact, 165,000 that bring together with them the munus, the honor and the burden, if we want, of the defense, while for 20 years of their life they would le be living in the province, and especially in the frontier areas, so not exactly the most urbanized or developed or safer, more tranquil parts. So, um, without uh, enjoying the in fact the, the pleasures offered by the great city uh, without the possibility of uniting to a focaria peregrina in the hope to transmit um, um, through her right when they would be discharged the civitas romana to the children um, bred by that union um, so th you, you understand how um, it was easier to recruit, by the way, the legionary troop from the same provinces, right? And how already through this way um, you can appreciate how, let's say, the, the, the more primitive peoples of the empire, for example, the Illyrians, that would in fact take over, say, in, a, in an ethnic sense, the army then, um, in the in the third century to save the same Rome actually um, uh, began uh, as a phenomenon that would characterize in fact the third century um, why? because these were the rougher peoples these were the poorer areas the least urbanized right? Um, but that exactly for this reason were more desperate and open to romanization this is an aspect that we often equivocate right? Um, there was a much greater interest in the participation to the Roman military the more uh, of an outsider you were because the outer side of Rome was the barbaric and so places where people had barely like any of the of the privileges that a legionary could have and that the legionary said well this is not so much if you look from my perspective at the praetorians and whatever that you know all things that these barbarians could not become right so this is also why i was mentioning before that level within the empire why you get again the illyrian period for example um why did these people serve rome so so brilliantly and exceptionally even though they were some of the least romanized parts of the empire right you you already understand how so many narratives that are, you uh, you often hear especially in an anti-roman sense are completely uh unhistorical and just unintelligent uh in the in the truest meaning of the war right and this is also um one of the reasons why the auxilia acquired ever greater importance in general right uh, why you would have them fighting and uh, like like the, in in their role auxiliary role it was the the toughest one right they often had to to carry out the the dirty uh, uh work uh of like you know the uh, paving the way to, to the roman legionnaires that mostly entered 
in, in combat in the great pitch battles in sieges and that left to the to the ally and the courses like the uh, of auxilia the sort of nastier tasks of guerrilla counterinsurgency like uh, reconnaissance uh, skirmishing etc like this these like were all um, forces that were serving Rome for the ultimate objective of reaching that legionary status that came together with the um, Roman citizenship optima jura right and this is the greatest vehicle of Romanization after the most originary uh, Roman conquest and as we've seen attempt to salvage the uh, civic cohesion uh, of the same in log. Uh, finally there is another very important aspect that is um, the stemming from the the evident prosperity of the empire um, founding itself uh, if you want on the balance between the man that had been mobilized for such a long time and the general like so the manpower and labor force in many ways so the agricultural trade output right uh, you must of course um, make this enormous dominion work for a single purpose and this has to act with the functionality that only the Romans were capable of affirming through this uh, regenerative um, capacity that in spite of the like the difficulties of the empire was essentially um, making it lead to this day as the the greatest experience um, of um, imperial uh, authority that would be uh, tentatively uh, salvaged by in fact like the by Constantinople by the Holy Roman Empire that are truly in their view the the full and unavoidable continuation of Romanity as the preservation of that transfiguring genus, right? Um, it's through transfiguration that, in, as we've seen, the sacrifice in combat that you can attain Romanity, right? It's it's not like as simple as, as it would become at, at a point like in a... but only when you consider that citizenship was not extended to... Uh, in a principle of uh, to a principle of mere okay we have now to make like today like there is a generalized understanding of okay of human rights or um sort of something we have to do because it's it's just it has it has to be this is a consideration it comes from very practical um concrete governmental issues but also from the idea that truly this empire has been founded by these ganas that now has created enough connections with the world to become indistinguishable from um, from the local one because the local one has changed so much that the, exi the mere uh, existence of the empire requires um, on the basis of this um, gluing like the necessity of Romanity in its entirety right and we will see this surely better in other videos right um, and so only things like plague or great uh, wars against the barbarians could shift this balance as it would happen uh, even though most of the balance shifted internally because it, the Romans mostly began to fight against one another um, and this would be surely quite uh, detrimental for the world but we're talking as you know even about early shatterings that people tend to Minimize saying, oh, look, like the Romanity lasted so long. Yes, but it's not to say that, like, certain blows were not important. The Antonine Plague um, was actually a big deal. It's not something that you need some attempt of, like, uh, I don't even know how to say it's, I don't know, some sort of bioarchaeological bio insight and how spread this was or whatever. You can immediately understand in the context of, say, the um, you know of the uh, the Marcomannic uh, invasion uh, uh, that matched with the same plague um, why Marcus Aurelius was obliged to mobilize troops also in Italy 
at that point after you know that uh, prevalence that we have seen uh, of provincial troops doesn't matter how much of Italian ancestry but now fundamentally severed um, locally speaking from from the the land of origin right and and this obviously was reflecting that a bit like we're all on our own which would essentially uh, risk to make the empire fall in the third century and that sort of reflects even just the the, the later history of provincial uh, not even of actual breaking of the empire but simply the collapse of of the hierarchy that had kept it together because essentially the various provinces went on like in, largely as we've seen recently in those videos about romano-germanic government and and warfare like sort of were to continue on the imperial administration um, uh, legislating in latin and, and beyond right the vita marchi in the storia augusta speaking of the aforementioned antonine issues speak of also a uh, the mobilization of slaves by Marcus Aurelius. This was actually a pretty, the, the indicator of a pretty dire situation because it was offensive to the prestige of the soldier, right? It, it had not been unheard of, like the Romans recurred to this tumultus um, um, already, say, I don't know, when Hannibal was at figuratively at the gates uh he would have not approached the gates anyway uh didn't have enough uh, resources to do so after Cannae, but it, it was in fact like uh, a pretty meaningful indicator of the blows that that occurred that arrived um in some instances of of an imperial balance that was able to suffer the swings even in you know some of the best moments right to be a roman um, ever, right, such as the Antonine era. So this should, you see, this is important because it makes you think about how empires are not held by wishful thinking. Like, there is not such a thing like, okay, now establish an empire and then it lasts by itself. You must make it work. And this is a very underappreciated aspect because people basically buy into the passive deterministic narrative that a terrible person arrives kills everybody and then there is nobody else um this is not what empires are um the uh the say empires reflect civilization and of course they do in different ways because not that there's not an empire that is equal to another there is not even a moment or a person that is equal to another ever so the same Roman Empire changes that much. But you must understand how this is not just like an accident of fate and how uh, this political accomplishment is the fruit of a universal traditional meaning that these people lived by, that especially the, the legions, the, the let's say the Roman military in general, the auxilia, of course, too, uh, and all the others, were actively living up to for like it, it's not uh, again it, it's difficult to appreciate it today i don't want to touch on all these various sort of perspectives that sometimes you come across on the internet and you start thinking what, what the hell you know what, why right why do we think still certain things? why are there people that get history so wrong to, to a perspective that is even if we're serving some um sub standard um, decline that's the same reason how empires fall in a way but that also um, in fact rely on the forgetfulness of the actual power that you always have at your disposal and especially if you are an empire right i mean the history of civilization in this sense despite of the fact that we have the eyes fixed on civilization so we tend to perceive just the um uh, let's say the how these uh, float and so how inherently there is a negative uh, force like some some sort of that upsets us about that like doesn't take into consideration first of all the continuity of civilization um even if when that uh between peoples like when 
Empire's Fall and how like this was factually like the best place to be uh, compared to anything else that existed except for you know some other few um, actually empire out there in the general scale right in order of scale um and how like in this sense you shouldn't concentrate so much on why the roman empire fell say uh rather uh, how it lasted so long and so not even presuming that this is a matter of equilibrism yes politically it is but it, it mostly starts from again the, the commitment of the people who make it up right and uh and i think that people should especially appreciate how much the the same contribution of the uh like of all these non-romans was crucial to the empire right so abandoning the idiotic basilic narrative of oh my god, the Romans were so terrible because they conquered other peoples, and actually focusing on these peoples that kept living under the Romans and were doing specific things, um, living in a much better condition than whoever was living out there, even to the extremes of becoming a military colonist more similar to a Serb. Yes, they still lived better than uh, what existed out there. Um, and also, all those who lived out there wanted nothing but to preserve that order right which instead was incredibly difficult to do and in fact they largely failed even when they took over so it's um a really a matter of i think historical objectivity that is something we should recover by simply you see when i say these things i of course i'm uh let's say um i'm given for granted that you understand why uh let's say, what kind of process uh, logically, rationally brings me to say this. Like, I take my time, as you see, even to, to explain these histories. Um, and I hope that you follow my pretty convoluted thread. Um, but uh, it also stems from the fact that this history is so self evident and macroscopically so that I, I don't understand how really anyone can think something else. I mean, I un actually understand that too, because it's one of my favorite sports, let's say, um, to properly psychoanalyze people by making them historical questions um, and correcting them, of course. But truly, because um, I don't think that any person who knows history can have another idea because really, uh, reality is only one, and it's not like history, like we live in a civilization in which there are diverging options of how history went uh, at these uh, at these levels, right? You know, there is not another alternative. That this is what usually, uh, you know, rings the the alarm bell whenever you hear somebody that tries to flip the the narrative because they. You automatically understand how they haven't done their homework in consolidating the awareness of why history is in that way, right? If the only person who flips history is the one that, in the sense, does not understand how unlikely it is to flip something of this scale, you know, um, and uh, and not unlikely, thirty percent against seventy. Um, here we're talking how you build history, and that's what, with all these videos that that is what I try to do. And of course, I have some sort of slashing and um, sometimes quite, um, you know, poignant, uh, I would say, a way of you know dialectically highlight the, the issues with with um, errors, with misunderstandings, but. Um, Taking your time, given that it's a finite, a finite time, in, in order to explain these things, it's uh, automatically requiring like a level of like if you don't get it, I don't give a damn, you know. And interestingly enough, I don't get much resistance to this. And every kind of criticism that ever arrives to me, which is never done on here, um, and it's also pretty low overall, is always about. I don't know, I don't like what this guy says, but when it takes time to, it gets to like explaining 
what is actually that I'm saying that is sort of wrong. You, you realize that these are the guys who just get triggered by the either by the conservative, um, uh, like uh, vibe or the the openly you know uh, counter. Like it, this is not even even easily definable. I would simply say this is tradition, right? But even if you say that, of course, that's very triggering because it always assumes that you you're a fanatic who starts from some sort of fairy tale understanding uh applied forcefully to raping history whereas you know this came actually and as you know following through through the years the most affectionated of you uh, by now having built up over the years on also uh, a pre-existing historical basis of already like substantial proportion i i, I was already studying for my doctorate when I started SharePoint. So, um, like, it would be interesting to uh, confront myself with um, critical views every once in a while, and except these views have to be at least understanding what I explain, because I'm taking my time to do so. So if you, the point is, I don't like you because you, you are just part of, I don't know, you by, uh, by criticizing the multiculturalistic interpretation of the Roman Empire, I don't even want to hear what what, what you what you say. Well, bad, right? You know, if you want to criticize anyone, you should at least know where do they, where, where do they come from overall, what they have done, what's their work about, and hardly anyone even listen to, like the entirety of a video like this, so or even less understands that. Uh, unfortunately, because I get it from the at least I, I I count on the silent majority that I expect in this sense to to be um, uh, green light like like uh, green lighting this in their moral um, spectrum. Um, other than that, like uh, I think it's just about crushing the the weak, uh, like the you know the the. the the barrier that people self-impose to to screen themselves from a danger that does not exist, or that exists, but that you you have any chance of defending yourself only if you cope uh, with it, if you fight with it, which is a primarily um, internal thing, um, and uh, you know not being scared of things that in fact do not really exist and letting the world falling down uh in the process so i think it's it's all very um it's a very relevant point in general to make and i and i count on going on with these videos because they're not even meant to be provocative at any level like i it truly like this is how i make a lesson normally so at least well i would provide with more material or something but let's say this is the beauty of youtube that you can make every point you you want talking about all the topics that you want and if you have the you know it doesn't take much guts i presume to be here to doing what to do what i do but it's um it's just like you accept it it's part of, of the deal it's, it's what makes it funny at the end of the day because the more you uh, uh, create this attrition and sort of the more value you produce uh, I believe and these ideas are going to break through there is nothing you can do about that like the truth um, whenever you you act um, uh, it's something you can't go against if you want to succeed so there is really uh, well, you can lack an interest you can be sleeping there you can make the entire system uh, shrink but who has the the power will take over. And so I think it's better to take over with the right fundamentals because otherwise that would crumble anyway. And so this is actually what the Romans were thinking themselves when issuing these laws. And, and I think that this data we read today is extremely meaningful for 
the for say reconstructing the uh, the the essence of their actual beliefs right without too much um, too much uh, misunderstanding what is there here to misunderstand is there another version to this I don't know any right also because these details I have never heard anyone talking about on the internet um, and uh, you know that's maybe what makes this content valuable um, for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye